I want to start it by saying shalom. Shalom from uh, Jerusalem. I'm 10 time zones and about 10,000 miles from home. Uh, I don't think I'm jet lagged, but you, by halfway through the lecture, if you think I'm making no sense, then I'll blame everything on being jet lagged. Although I have been in the U.S. for about a week, so I've slowly caught up to uh, Pacific time. Uh, it's um, 2 o'clock. It's 10 p.m. tonight in Jerusalem right now. So, okay. So, shalom. We'll start with that. Now, the title of my talk today is Israeli Media and threats to Israeli press freedoms. But I want you to pay special attention to the um, second half of the title, The Challenges of Journalism in a Country Invented by a Journalist. Now, you think journalists have no power or no potential to impact and affect uh, a country or a nation or a people. I think um, my goal today is to show you that that uh, is an inaccurate assumption and that journalism and journalists can have a tremendous amount of power and impact and for good and occasionally on the other side of that equation. So really it's very, the second part of this title is crucial, is crucial to understanding both Israeli media and Israel. The origins and daily practices of Israel's media are really different from the media that you know here in the United States. In these days, Israeli journalists are facing challenges to their ability to report stories and express their opinions. And both the challenges they're facing, as well as the way they're responding to these challenges, are shaped by the history and experience of, Israel, of media in Israel. So today we're going to review the genesis of Israeli media and peer into the future. But I want to do this in three parts. I want a little bit about me. Uh, not too much. My wife says I talk too much about myself. A little, too, a little about me, a little about Israel, and a little bit about Israeli media because I don't think you can really grasp some of the significance, the really different aspects of media in Israel if you don't understand a little bit about the country in which they came from. Okay, me. That's me. I have a master's in uh, journalism from the School of Journalism and Communications. That's my email. And that's my Twitter handle. And maybe with your help, I'll get over 590 uh, followers today. I've taken me forever to get to 500, and I don't know if I'll ever get to 600. So maybe if a couple of you, let's see, 10 out of 400 plus of you, I'll pop over 600 at least for today. OK, so I, get, I did get my master's in journalism here. And it was a great two years. There was a terrific faculty and many good friends. But my journalism story did not begin here. I loved comic books. And when I was a kid, I loved comic books, particularly Superman. And I watched and rewatched what, are now, what was the first of the now many TV shows about Superman. But while I loved comics and Superman, and I watched these shows many times, I really wanted to be Clark Kent. For me, at that point in the late 1950s and early 1960s, was that Clark to me, was the hero. He didn't need superpowers to fight crime and injustice. His pencil, his notepad, and the typewriter were enough to stand up to bullies, crooks, and corrupt politicians. And I realize now that I also wanted, I craved the camaraderie of the newsroom that Clark had even in this early show. So what appealed to me then is still an essential feature of what I think is great about journalism. It's a meritocracy. Meaning, if you bring in a good story, you shoot a good photograph or a great video, your career will advance. It's not a perfect system. Discrimination and prejudice and antiquated values still exist in today's media. But journalism has been a field where accomplishment has always counted for more than connections. And I work with people who had connections and did not survive in their journalism careers. And I work with people who did not have any connections but by dint of hard work and, and their passion for the work, not just uh, survived, but, but thrived. So I wanted to be Clark. My first time in print, an electrifying moment for me, was as a letter to the editor of this distinguished publication, Detective Comics. I wrote a letter to the editor saying something about how much I liked how much I like Batman. And what was really interesting, I learned a lesson about journalism in that very first moment, is that the editor rewrote my letter to make it sound more, more the way he wanted it to sound and not the way 
I thought it should sound. He added adjectives and exclamation points. And a short side note, I believe very strongly in the belief that you have two exclamation points to use in your entire writing media career. So use them carefully. If you've used one already in your last text, you got one left. So regardless of the fact that I already had a thing about editors, I was hooked. OK, very quickly, a little bit about me. I started out at my journalism career at my high school newspaper, and I never thought again about my chosen profession. My college newspaper, I was a sports writer in college. And even then, without going into details of what, this, what that kind of obscure headline means, I learned then that even sports journalism can be political. So, in between my first and second years at the J School master's degree program, I spent the summer in Nyssa, Oregon. It's a small town on the eastern border of the state. You can see here, it's so far from here, it's about a seven hour drive, that it's on mountain time. Did anybody, is there anybody here from the eastern part of the state who knows that? Yeah. Hmm? Yes, okay. Mountain time, you grew up on mountain time? Okay, so Nyssa is closer to Boise a lot closer to Boise than it is to Portland, and that the, lower, the southeastern corner, Malheur County of Oregon, is on mountain time. It, actually, this is quite a remarkable little town. Its population is extraordinarily diverse, especially considering its location. That's, again, maybe for another time. But I want to take a brief story that taught me a lot about how journalism should not work. And if you, I strongly urge you, if you want to go into journalism, to seek out internships, because you learn both the best and the worst of what journalism can be. So on a Tuesday night, this is a weekly paper, on a Tuesday night I covered a school board meeting. And the school board voted to put a $1 million ballot item on, uh, $1 million bond issue on the ballot for the fall. The voters in town had already voted no, but the school board really, really, really wanted that bond issue. They wanted to build a gymnasium. So they put it back on the ballot in the summer, and they wanted to get, kind of slip it through. So the next morning, I went into the office to write the story. And after I finished writing it, um, it was about 10 o'clock, 11.30, 10, 11 o'clock in the morning on a Wednesday. The school superintendent came down Main Street. And it turned out, by the way, to give a little bit of spoiler, the publisher of the paper also really wanted this bond issue. So as I wrote the article, the school superintendent came down Main Street in his Lions Club vest. It's a little nylon vest, that, uh, and he walked in. He was on his way to the group's weekly luncheon meeting. So on his way down Main Street, he was wearing his vest, and he stopped by our storefront office on Main Street. He opened the door, and he walked in to meet the publisher who had the same vest hanging on a hook of his office door. And uh, they were going to go to lunch together. So the uh, publisher asked me for my story. He said, Alan, can I have your story, please? He took it into his office with the school superintendent. And he rewrote it to their satisfaction, because however I had phrased it, they didn't feel it was going to sell the bond issue enough. So I learned a little bit then about how power structures, in fact, can affect the news. This is a very small thing. It happens, however, on a much larger scale. This is. I don't know if you know the term a fractal. A fractal is like the seed crystal, right? The tiny little thing in a, of a crystal, as it grows, it's the same thing. You keep slicing it and slicing it, you still get the same shape. So this was a fractal of what journalism can be like. When the power structures in a small town of about 2,000 people, the school superintendent and the publisher, part of the same social network, shape the news product to suit their aims. I can't remember, frankly, to tell you off and if, in fact, the bond issue passed, and it's so long ago, I couldn't track it down on the internet. So, next. Where did I go after that? After graduation, I went to work at the Bulletin in Bend. Anybody here from Bend? It's a great city. It was a lovely, small newspaper. It was my first daily newspaper job. The publisher would bring young reporters to dinner at his home about once a month. Now, we appreciated that, but the reason he did it is that he paid us so little, we didn't have enough money to buy ourselves groceries for the entire month. So he was kind of making up for it by inviting us to dinner once in a while at his house. And while we were there, of course, he had to tell us stories about how, uh, how important he was, how many, how he used, he was just at a meeting with the publisher of the Washington Post and the New York Times. And um, he was a very interesting guy. 
but he, he regaled us with tales about journalism and kind of filled our heads with, with, with big dreams. And by the way, he had one other hobby that if you ever work at a daily newspaper of any size, you will probably learn. One of the hobbies of newspaper publishers, don't ask me why, is piloting their own planes. He had his own plane literally parked out in the backyard and it was you know, pretty flat out there in Ben. He... Okay. After that, after Ben, I moved back east, and I, we don't have time to go into that story, but I worked for a few years in Burlington, Vermont. Anybody recognize who that is? Okay, so I covered the first campaign by Bernie Sanders when he ran for mayor of Burlington in 1980. And he said, by the way, the same things he said last year. I, I found some old clips of my stories from 1980, and all you have to do is substitute a, a B for an M, because he talked about the millionaires that are controlling th our city in Burlington, Vermont in 1980. And then he was talking about the billionaires that are controlling um, the economy today, and it's, he has not changed a bit. By the way, he, he still hates the media. He hated the media then. He did not like our newspaper. He thought we were tools of corporate media, which I guess kind of sort of we were. But he hasn't changed a bit. He's a little more gray, although he, he looks about the same. That's a pretty good caricature, I think. And that was the story I wrote about him after his election for mayor. So after that, I went to Washington, D.C., where I worked at a variety of news organizations. Uh, States News Service was the first. We used to race each other, other to the bank on Fridays because we weren't sure the last one in line would be able to cash their paychecks. <clears throat> Guess what happened after I was there for a little while? Gone. States News Service was gone. Um, then I worked at another place that is gone. My, one of my last stops in, uh, in daily newspapering in America was in New Jersey. I did some of my best investigative work there. The political scandal I looked into that is reported here really could have provided the template to the Sopranos. There was a federal criminal case against the Luciano family, but it fell apart after a key witness died in a mysterious mountain climbing accident. After a 69 count indictment, the main witness disappeared, literally climbing mountains, and I, this one, I couldn't make it up, even if I wanted to. Albany, New York was my last stop in American journalism before my family and I moved to Israel. I worked first at the Jerusalem, I worked in a few places, including the Jerusalem Post, where I put together the front page on 9-11, or 9-12 actually, and then I went to their website. Uh, I worked on English websites, uh, news websites in Israel, and um, I uh, wrote a very short book about uh, Ilan Ramon, the Israeli astronaut who died in the space shuttle accident in 2003. But I want to not to talk about my book, which is still for sale, but I don't want to talk about my book. <laughs> I want to I tell you that why, why is this an important thing? This was a, a signal moment in Israeli internet media. So the, challenge, the, the shuttle broke up over Texas on its re-entry to Earth's atmosphere on a Saturday morning which was afternoon Israel, came to the Jerusalem Post, jpost.com, looking for news about the Israeli astronaut and the story of what had happened. There was nothing there. Ouch. That was, that was a real wake-up call. I mean, it was a terrible tragedy, but on the journalistic front, it was a wake-up call that news websites in Israel and elsewhere learned early on, you have to run 24-7. Finally, we staffed at the, the desk after sundown after the Sabbath was over and we caught up to the story, but it was a black guy that, frankly, I don't think I ever recovered from. All right, I'll take a short breather. These are purple lupins. They grow only in a few spots in Israel. I took this picture uh, last March. Any questions at the moment? Okay, just take a breather. They, they don't smell nice, but just <sighs> wildflowers. Okay, a little bit about Israel. Israel became a state recognized by the United Nations in 1948, but we need to go back a little further than that for some context. In 1894, the French army convicted French army captain Alfred Dreyfus of treason for giving French military secrets to Germany. So bear with me, this is a relevant part of the lecture. It's not jet lag. Dreyfus, who was Jewish, and was, by the way, a relative of Julia Louis-Dreyfus of Veep, 
was sentenced to life imprisonment in solitary confinement on Devil's Island in French Guiana, the famous, infamous prison, Devil's Island. So the German journalist Theodor Herzl, who was Jewish, covered the trial, and it was a media sensation of its day across Europe, as sensational as any criminal trial of today, given the context of the times and uh, the old-fashioned newspapers. However, after his conviction, within a few years, it became clear that Dreyfus had been framed, and the uncovering of a massive French government and military conspiracy against him revealed unchecked anti-Semitism in France. So, the Dreyfus Affair and other incidents stirred something in Herzl. Forty years before Hitler's rise to power, Herzl came to believe that anti-Semitism in Europe meant Jews had no future there. He published the utopian novel which described a future Jewish state in what was then the Ottoman province, uh, the, the Ottoman province of Palestine. We'll come back to that if you're not sure what that means. Ottoman Palestine. Herzl began a campaign to create a Jewish state, and in 1897, 120 years ago, he and others convened the first Zionist Congress. This gathering gave a political focus to Zionism, which is the philosophy behind the creation of a Jewish state in the Holy Land. 20 years later, the Ottoman Empire was defeated in World War I. The League of Nations, a precursor to the UN, divided up Ottoman territory. The French got what is today Syria and Lebanon, the, uh, and Iraq, uh, sorry, not Iraq, they got, the British got Iraq, but the orange at the top of the map, this area that is Palestine and Jordan was given to the British. The League gave Palestine and Iraq as a mandate to govern. They were said, you manage this part of the world. It's colonialism, it's problematic, but this is what happened in 1922, and here's a tiny bit of what it looked like back then. This is real footage from uh, 1917. This is the entrance to Jerusalem. And that is uh, Allenby, Edmund Allenby, the British general who uh, conquered um, uh, Palestine for the British army. In fact, um, it was hard to see in there because it just goes by quickly. In his entourage that day was Lawrence of Arabia, not dressed in the robes though. Okay. In the ensuing 25 years, thousands of Jews from Europe and elsewhere migrated to Palestine and began setting up the infrastructure for a state. By the end of World War II, and I'm really skipping by a lot of detail here, but I wanted to give you a few basics. By the end of World War II, an exhausted Britain, facing the crumbling of its empire, was ready to leave the Middle East. Two years later, 70 years ago this month, the young United Nations partitioned Palestine into Jewish and Arab states. The orange is Israel, and the, uh, or, uh, and the yellow is, is Palestine. The white around Jerusalem was going to be internationally administered. Seven months later, on the day the British left Palestine, Israel declared its independence. Herzl was long gone by then. He never lived in Palestine and died in 1904 at only 44 years old. But his vision, his writing, and his advocacy provided the impetus and even the core myths for what fueled the creation of the State of Israel. He set the template for what journalism became in Israel that is repeated today by virtually every journalist in the country, which is why I wanted to kind of go through some of this lengthy background process. Israeli media are activist, they're opinionated, and they're goal-oriented. Herzl's famous declaration, if you will it, is no dream. And that saying is essential for understanding both the State of Israel and the journalists who work there. This is a very different historical background from the way journalism is practiced in the United States. So, but speaking of journalism, let's go back to that Palestine Post front page real quickly. It offers a hint about how a Jerusalem website, which you may remember I just mentioned, would handle a similarly momentous news story 55 years later. So follow the bottom arrow. The State of Israel was proclaimed on a Friday afternoon shortly before the Jewish Sabbath, when, as I mentioned, all work is supposed to cease for observant Jews. Now, Israel's day of rest is Saturday as a result. So to look at the top arrow, the Palestine Post reported this story only on Sunday, the first day of the work week, right? Our work week in Israel is Sunday through Thursday. So think about how this may have affected reporting as we enter the Internet age. Oh, right. 
That Jerusalem website was unstaffed on a Saturday afternoon when a space shuttle crashed. Can you imagine a story this big waiting a day and a half before it sees light? That's kind of in the, it's in the core DNA of, 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 of journalism in Israel. Now, back in 1948, the Arab, nation, Arab nations surrounding Israel attacked the new state after it declared its independence. The UN stepped in more than a year later after some very serious uh, fighting and military battles. The armistice it brokered ended the fighting. They fell far short of peace agreements and set boundaries, set borders, however, but they stopped the fighting. And the state, remember, on the left is the image of what the state was supposed to be, according to the UN, which the Israeli uh, uh, leadership accepted, and, then, and the right is what uh, the state looked like after the war. Israel fought subsequent wars with its neighbors in 1956, 1967, 1970, 1973, 1982, and 2006. The country's borders, which have never been recognized by the world from day one, have changed with each conflict, and they remain unsettled today. Israel's population is nearing 9 million. This is a girls judo team, by the way. They're some international competition. By comparison, by the way, Oregon, which is 12 times larger than the state of Israel, has a population of 4 million. Less than half the population, 12 times the size. Kind of a dense little place. The Jewish state is about three quarters Jewish. Arabs total 21% of the population. More than 90% of those Israeli Arabs are Muslim. But that oversimplifies the situation. Neither Israel's Jews or Arabs can or should be defined in a single sentence or image. It's just not fair to anybody. Israelis can be Muslim, Greek Orthodox Christian, Druze, Circassian, Syriac Christian, Aramean, Samaritan, Armenian Christian, Bedouin, and many, many more. This is, again, that's only a sample. By the way, this photo is from a school in Jerusalem that is uh, distinctly designed for Jewish and Arab children. Each class has two teachers. One teaches in Arabic and the other teaches in Hebrew. Every class, math, science, they don't teach English in Arab. They have an Arabic speaking and a Hebrew speaking teacher for their English classes as well. It's called the Dulushoni, the two language school. As for Israel's Jews, half define themselves as secular. 30% as traditional, which means different things to different people. I kind of fall in that category. 13% as religious, and 9% as ultra-Orthodox, like the young boys here studying in the yeshiva. We could spend our entire semester just delving into the shadings and overlaps of these definitions. And along with the religious divisions, Israeli Jews are ethnically diverse. They, they come from more than 100 countries around the world. Jews from Ethiopia are the country's latest wave of immigrants from the 1990s and the early 2000s. They followed one million from the former Soviet Union, who started coming in the 1990s. Russian, Ukrainian, and Jews from other former Soviet republics like Belarus now comprise more than 10% of the country. The Speaker of Israel's parliament, Yuli Edelstein, was a Soviet political prisoner in Siberia before he came to Israel. Hundreds of thousands came from Central and Eastern Europe in the years before and after World War II. Additional hundreds of thousands came from Arab and Muslim countries. Most were expelled or pressured to leave their homelands after the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. These children and the old man are from Yemen, Jews from Yemen. By the way, compared to the Russian, Moroccan, and Romanian Jews in Israel, there are relatively few Jews from English-speaking countries. This is the Israeli national cricket team, and it's pretty much all the cricket players in the country. However, untold thousands play soccer. Now, Israel is a parliamentary democracy. There are 120 members of a one-house national legislature called the Knesset. They are elected by party, not region. And these are the paper ballots used in national elections. Each represents a different political party. They have a two or, one, two, or three-letter code for each party. You can see the number of parties in there. And by the way, with paper ballots, we haven't had much in the way of ballot tampering or some of the concerns that you may, I've heard you may be having in this country. I don't know much about that. <laughs> now, the party of our current prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, holds only one quarter of the 120 seats. To reach a majority, he enlisted four of the parties as partners. To get them on board, he gave each of them their own ministries, their own departments. 
So, for example, an ultra-Orthodox party controls the interior ministry. A different religious party controls the health ministry. A secular party, primarily of Russian immigrants, controls the defense ministry, and so on. So it often leads to the government seeming to speak with many voices. In fact, there are times when nobody knows who's in charge. Nope. So there are a coalition of three primarily Arab parties has 11 seats. They're not currently sitting in the government, but their voices are heard. Here, Ahmed Tibi, who's sitting as the chairman of, the, of the, this session of parliament, ejects a Jewish Knesset member with whom he gets into a shouting match. Kicked him out. This happens all the time, by the way. So as you saw, the Knesset can get raucous. At the recent opening of our legislative session this year, Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu went on the attack. Netanyahu rips opposition media as sourpusses. He used the Hebrew term, which means pickles, actually, but literally means pickles, but it was interpreted as meaning they're a bunch of sourpusses, apparently. Here, Netanyahu uses the term incitement to taunt his opponents. That was a term, I don't know if you saw in the subtitles, that TB, excuse me, that the Knesset member that TB kicked out used to incitement. It's a very slippery, problematic term. We won't have time again to get into a lot of it, but it's used a lot because of the, there's a different understanding of what freedom of speech is in Israel. Members of the Knesset are shouting at the prime minister at the tops of their lungs, or they're throwing their arms up in the air. There's a lot of this in the Knesset. There's a lot of this. You see, I'm doing it too. There's a lot of this with the hands. So it's a very, it's a very slippery term, problematic. It's used... Incitement is used both against, uh, in, in, against politicians and against the media. It's v from a journalist's perspective, I find it very troubling. In this clip, Netanyahu tries sarcasm, uses sarcasm on one of his fiercest opponents. By the way, this is... This is... That person, is, his name is, is Yair Lapid. He used to be... Uh, a prominent television uh, news talk show host. He's now the head of his own political party. It's called Yeshatid, which means there's a future. Yeshatid shall Yair Lapid. Like, he's, and in fact, it, it's, I think this is really problematic. He, the, the, if you sign on as, as a member of his party, and you, especially if you want to be on his list of Knesset members, you have to sign a piece of paper that says Yair Lapid will always be the chairman of this party. There are no primaries. There's no democracy in, in this pol particular political party. A lot of this, right? Okay, so journalism and politics, as I said, can be a revolving door in Israel. The American media scene has become a lot more political, I know. But virtually all Israeli journalists take political stands, and some of them back that up by running for office. There are currently more than 10 journalists in the parliament. That's about... The 10% of the parliament, of the Knesset, is made up of journalists. That would be... What, 45 or so, 40 or so members of the House and 10 senators, not just being the PR guy or the one whispering in, in the, in the uh, politicians here what to say, writing their speeches, but actually joining a party and running for office. Here, one of them is Shelly Yakimovich. Here she is. She's facing microphones from two of her former employers, Ch TV Channel 2 and Reshet Bet. That's that uh, black and yellow thing with that, uh, the, uh, the yellow microphone cap. Um, that's a public radio station. So, how does this happen? Israel doesn't have a constitution the way the U.S. does. I won't whitewash or pinkwash, as some say, Israel's flaws and failures, but it has enshrined civil liberties, individual freedoms, and group rights in what are called basic laws. It's a close, it's somewhere more than a law, but it's not so difficult, not so embedded in our DNA as a constitution. Virtually every 18-year-old Israeli teen goes into the army for mandatory service for two to three years. The Israel Defense Forces is one of the central pillars of Israeli society. It performs many functions you wouldn't expect, including education, social integration for marginal groups, minorities, and individuals, and even journalism. So we'll talk more about that in a second. Most Arab Israelis and ultra-Orthodox Jews do not serve in the army, but there are exceptions. And the mandatory service is usually followed by a six-month to one-year trek to exotic locales. Like, almost everybody, my friends, my son's friends are now South America, Thailand, 
Chile, uh, India, on the beach, there's a beach in India called Goa where basically people just sit around naked for months at a time smoking weed and re unwinding. It's, I haven't been there, but that's what I hear. I didn't go, I wasn't in the army, I moved to Israel too late. But what this means is that Israelis don't generally begin university until they are 22 or older. Israel has the oldest college students in the world. After shrugging off decades of a once... Oh, wait, did I skip something there? No. No, okay. After shrugging off decades of a once necessary but eventually stifling socialist, almost Bolshevik, communist-style economy, Israel's become the most economically advanced country in Southwest Asia and the Middle East. Products like the USB flash drive, the first Intel PC processor right in here, and Google suggest function, which automatically completes search box text. Search box text. I can't say that. Search box text were invented in Israel. Israel has the second largest number of startup companies in the world after the US, and the third largest number of NASDAQ listed companies after the US and China. Virtually every major tech company in the world has research and development unit in Israel. Samsung is just one of the latest. Back on the political side, in 1978, after four full-scale wars and years of scattered fighting, Israel and Egypt formed a peace deal. It returned the vast Sinai Peninsula to Egypt. In 1994, Israel and Jordan signed a peace deal. In both cases, it's, not, it's a real peace, but it's a cold peace. There isn't a lot of warmth between these two former enemies. But there are significant business, government, and security dealings. In fact, I just came back from speaking at a conference of young journalists in Jordan. So I can't, I shouldn't, and I won't skip the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Tensions led to street warfare in 1987, terrorism throughout the 1990s, a brutal uprising in the early 2000s that cost thousands of lives, full-scale mil military conflagrations in 2008, 2012 and 2014, which were not part of that other list of wars that I gave you dates of, and smaller scale but no less tragic outbursts that occur almost daily. This conflict affects the daily life for 4 million Palestinians, nearly 9 million, 9 million Israelis, and uncounted millions on Israel's borders. Again, there's really no time today to even to scratch the surface of this struggle's complexities. For now, let me just say, that it defines our lives and our global relations even as daily life goes on for all of us. Going to school, going to work, getting a job, going to the supermarket. But the lack of a peace agreement between Israel and Palestine makes life immeasurably more difficult for all. Okay, second breather. I could use a breather. This is sunrise. Um, over the Ramon Crater in southern Israel. It's a beautiful spot. It's a world-class. It's like the Grand Canyon, but it's actually not formed by a river. It's really spectacular. It's really beautiful. Okay, so now we're going to finally get to Israeli media. I know that was supposedly what I came to talk about, but I really wanted to give you enough background. Um, I'm obviously running late on my time, so I'm going to try and zip through some of this stuff here. Okay? There were no printing presses in the Ottoman Empire until the mid-19th century. Illiteracy, rural life, and Ottoman censorship held back the development of newspapers. The return of Jews to the land of Israel, or Palestine, what is also called the Holy Land, brought in the precursors of today's Israeli journalism. Following the lead of earlier publications in Russia, Poland, and elsewhere, the Jewish papers of Palestine were driven by political and social agendas, not by making money. They were not commercial ventures. Some aimed to revive Hebrew, the language of Hebrew. Others sought to make Israel, the, the Jewish population in Israel, more Zionist. The idea of objective journalism, as you may understand it here in the United States, wasn't even thought of. Nobody even gave that any, any thought whatsoever. In 1908, the young Turks revolted uh, in the Ottoman Empire, and they relaxed some of the regulatory restrictions in the Ottoman Empire, but they didn't end it. And that that very year, more than a dozen Arabic papers opened up, and another 20 rose by the beginning of World War I. Arabic papers, like the Jewish and Hebrew papers, became, themselves became vehicles for disseminating nationalist ideals. <clears throat> they argued internal political and social battles among the land's Arab majority. They uniformly opposed Zionism and British rule. And the same thing, objective journalism, wasn't in the, was not in their DNA. 
When the British came in, the situation didn't change much. They stiffened Ottoman laws that required newspapers to have licenses, which allowed them to censor things and shut papers down when they thought it was appropriate. The State of Israel establishment of the State of Israel freed things up a little bit, but the media didn't really change. Newspapers with commercial goals were rare. The newspapers were actually owned by political parties. So this paper, Davar, was owned by the Labor Party, which was the leading, the ruling party in Israel for 40 years, from the first 30 years of the state. Not wanting to be outdone, the government set up a broadcasting agency, Kol Yisrael, the Voice of Israel, a radio and TV. <clears throat> Domestic commercial radio and TV began only in the 1990s. <laughs> Media fair and TV in Israel is pretty much like everywhere else. Sitcoms, dramas, reality programs, and the news. So we have A Star is Born. We have this show about the marriage where the couple meets each other the first day under the, at the wedding ceremony. I don't even... Apparently it's a big show, too. <clears throat> we have cable TV with CNN and BBC and Fox and all o from all over the world. Ah, Israeli drama and comedy series are prominent throughout world, the world now. Homeland, you've heard of Homeland, right? It's an American version of an Israeli TV show. This show, Fauda, which is about Israeli undercover agents in Arab communities, is actually on Netflix in Hebrew, the original Hebrew with subtitles. They didn't even reproduce it. They just bought it outright and subtitled it. It's a really good show if you want to watch it. It's absolutely worth watching. Um, <clears throat> government radio has kind of been, I'm going to skip a little bit because I want to leave us time for, com for questions. Government radio is staggering. However, the, one of the country's most important news talk radio station and its pop music partner, Gal Galatz, is run by the Army. And in fact, until recently, the Army ran the only journalism school in Israel. Think about that one. It still trains young soldiers as reporters and sends them to cover news events, not just Army activities. And most, uh, many of Israeli's leading journalists got their start in the Army as in their radio or magazines. And I think some of the journalists now in the Knesset, in the Parliament, also worked for Israel, for, for the... Did, they worked as journalists for their army service. They didn't carry a gun. They didn't sit at a checkpoint. They didn't uh, bring coffee to the general. Um, they weren't in a commando unit. They were journalists for their army service. Commercial print. Um, this is, was the largest paper in Israel, Yediot Achronot. By the way, it's uh, a funny mix. It's, it's a tabloid with lots of sex and scandals and crime but it also has the leading political commentator in the country and some of the best analysis of political news. Um, here's another one, it's called Yisrael Hayom, which means Israel Today. But this, kind of, this paper looks like the other one, but it's actually quite different because it's owned by an American billionaire, Sheldon Adelson, and it's one of those, it's like the old papers, it's distinctly designed to be political. It's all about supporting Benjamin Netanyahu. <clears throat> Oh, and Trump, but president, no, Net, uh, sorry, sorry, Adelson has pulled back from Trump. Until recently, he was also a big supporter. Israeli internet um, is very innovative. I think that's okay. I created the English version of, of this website. This is Ynet, the largest Hebrew news site in the country. I created the English version, Ynet News, but it never became a big hit. The owner didn't invest that much in it. <clears throat> There are many other media that are much more politically motivated. Haaretz, which is the leading liberal intellectual paper in the country, has spent a lot of money to create an English print edition and a very popular English website, uh, which is worth reading. But you have to understand that it comes at the news from a very left-wing political stance. OK, final break before we get to the last tidbits here. This is a, a, a waterfalls in northern Israel. I took this picture also a couple months ago. Okay. Israelis are obsessed by the news. There's a lot of it, right? War, violence, political scandals, celebrity gossip, sports, a lot of sports. NBA scores are on the hourly news, the hourly radio news. They report NBA scores during the year, even though there's, only, there's one Israeli in the NBA, but everybody loves the NBA. Uh, I don't know. Newspaper readership is uh, still very popular, even though almost everybody has internet and smartphones. The, Sunday, the weekend papers, which come out on Friday, not Sunday, they have 2,000, they routinely weren't 
run two, three thousand word articles that people read over the weekend. Israel has legal protections. This is the Supreme Court. It's affirmed that freedom of expression is an essential component. But again, we don't have a constitution. We don't have a First Amendment. It's easier to exert pressure on Israeli media. Authorities routinely conduct investigations and surveillance of journalists. They want to uncover their sources and intimidate them. Laws that are holdovers from the British and the Ottoman eras are still on the books. Journalists and others, for example, raised a stink recently after there was a recent threat to strip credentials from Al Jazeera's Jerusalem correspondent. There is legal censorship in Israel, but it's essentially limited to topics pertaining to military and security issues. But getting around the rules is a way of life. When the media want to describe events such as Israel's bombing of a nuclear reactor in Syria in 2007, which we've never, Israel has never officially acknowledged, that's what it was on the left, and then on the right is a photograph of what it looked like after the bombing. But they run the picture, they say, foreign news reports say Israeli bombers bombed the Syrian uh, nuclear reactor. Israel's a small country. A small number of companies control a good deal of the economy, including the media. And for these reasons and others, Israel has received mixed scores from international observers for its degree of media freedom. It's listed only as partly free. It's not as free as some, and you see the US isn't as free as Norway, and it's freer than others, such as Lebanon, Jordan, and Egypt. So most Israeli media hew to one political side or another. Arut Sheva, the one on the top here, Arut Sheva, uh, A7 sometimes called, it's an outspoken supporter of West Bank settlers and is critical of what it sees as attacks on religion. And that influences every story they write. Haaretz is the mirror image. It's deeply opposed to the settlements and it's critical of religion in public life in Israel. It's rare that, twist, that facts are outright twisted, but of course, story selection, the people you decide to interview, and a different focus brings media organizations, politics, and goals to light. Here's one that says, shame. This is from somebody, the newspaper didn't like something the President of the United States said, so they took it upon themselves to, to wag their finger at him. That's what it boils down to, right? Israeli media are colorful, profane, and lively. We lack a First Amendment. There is political pressure and legal censorship and concentration of ownership, but, but there's such a drive for getting information out that the Israeli media overcome constantly, constantly fight and overcome a lot of these battles. And as I said, the key difference based on the history of the Israeli media are that there is no such thing as objectivity. Everybody's upfront about their politics and they're politically activist in the columns of the newspaper. Now you may think that that's what media are here, but you have no idea of what it can be like. I won't say goodbye, because hopefully I'll see you again. Lahitra Oat means I'll see you later. Thank you very much. <laughs>